The views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the participants and do not reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. BronxNet. Your voice, your views, your vision. Hello and welcome to Open, the one and only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your host, Cristina Pagan, and today we'll update you on what's happening in and around our community. Coming up on today's show, it was a close race between Congressman Charlie Rangel and State Senator Adriano Espalat over the 13th District primaries, a nail-biter until the very end. We'll have the results. Then we'll have a two-part discussion on the Census Bureau surveys and what information gathered can mean for you. After that, we'll tell you about what the South Bronx Company launched the biggest interweb mall on the superhighway. And lastly, author and spoken word artist Dayelle stops by to perform and share her latest book. We'll have all this and much more. It's headed your way because we are now officially open. Hola mi gente, I'm your host Cristina Pagan and today is Wednesday, June 25th and of course you're watching Open, the only live and interactive program that brings the Bronx and New York City straight to your TV set. We want to encourage you to stay connected to us. You can find us on Twitter at BronxNet TV and Facebook at Open BronxNet Television. Yesterday, many of you might have hit the polls to vote in the 13th district primaries and still not have declared a winner. Congressman Charles Rangel was leading his challenger, State Senator Adriano Espalat, late Tuesday after a tough primary. With 100% of precincts reporting in New York's 13th district, Rangel led Espalat at 47.4% to 43.6%, but the Associated Press said it was too close to call, with an unspecified number of absentee and provisional ballots still waiting to be counted. Absentee ballots must be received by the New York City Board of Ex Elections no later than next Tuesday in order to be counted. Senator Espalat has not conceded, saying the race is too close to call. About four years ago, we were all counted as part of the 2010 Census. Now you may be wondering why you are receiving a form, a phone call, or a visit from the U.S. Census Bureau. What some people may not know is that the Census Bureau is the principal source of data about the country's population, economy, and places every month of every year. The federal agency conducts a variety of surveys that provide information ranging from the unemployment rate to health insurance coverage. So do not be surprised if you see a Census Bureau representative in your neighborhood. Our guest today, Alexandra Barker, data dissemination specialist and media relations from the U.S. Census Bureau, will be talking to us about the surveys that they conduct in the Bronx and about their findings about our community. So, thank you for being here today. Oh, thanks for having us. Awesome. So, um, as I, I just said, we did a Census Bureau, like a, a census in 2010, when nobody would expect to see you until 2020. So what, is, what are you guys doing here in the Bronx? Well, we are known to conduct the census every 10 years. That's on the Constitution. We count every person in the nation. So we counted the population of the Bronx in 2010. Mm -hmm. What we are uh, now doing, and we do every year, every month of every year, we conduct a variety of surveys. Mm -hmm. Some of the surveys are our own surveys. Some surveys are on behalf of other federal agencies. We are the statistical, um, uh, the agents leading out the statistical information for the nation in the, about people, about the economy, and about places. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of this information we collect, it's uh, very important. Um, so um, to, to inform decisions that will prov um, help provide services for the community or even infrastructure such as where to build a hospital, or do we need to change the way we do transportation here, do we need more schools? Mm -hmm. So the information um, has to be up to date. That's why we collect um, data every month and release most of our results every year. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the surveys, um, you receive calls, some of them we receive a visit from the Census Bureau. So there's a lot going on in the Bronx right now. Gotcha. Uh, what kind of surveys do you conduct in the Bronx? Uh, right now we have seven uh, permanent surveys. Mm -hmm. So every month you're going to have our staff, our field representatives visiting households in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. um, some of them, uh, like the American Community Survey, um, we visit uh, random selected households and we collect information on their socioeconomic um, 
um, housing information and demographic information. Mm -hmm. We also have the current population survey on behalf of the Bureau of Labor Statistics. You probably hear about the unemployment rate mm -hmm. every month in the news. Well, yeah. we do collect a survey on behalf of the Bureau of Labor Statistics to be able to produce that information that's very important yeah. uh, for our country. Uh, and that survey, it's also every month here in the Bronx. We have other surveys such as the Crime and Victimization Survey on behalf of the Department of Justice. We have a survey on behalf of that we conduct on behalf of the uh, Department of Health. So there's a, a lot going on. We also have some um, surveys that happen maybe every five years. Right now we are conducting the survey of business owners mm -hmm. and that's every five years. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot going on. So I expect to see us around all the time. Uh, and why, why should people in our community participate in these? Service. Well, while data from the single census is really important for reapportionment and redistricting, so it has to do with power and money, mm -hmm. right? Um, data from our surveys is what keeps us informed of how our communities are changing over, t over time, the trends. Are we getting wealthier? Poor? Uh, is our population aging? Um, how is our, our um, um, working patterns changing, people shifting occupations? Uh, so having this data available every year will inform the people really making decisions about where funding should go. Mm -hmm. So if we know there are more kids going to school in the Bronx, okay. the data is showing that that's a sign for those making decisions about funding the schools where the money should be going, how much should go. Right. So having an accurate information about this community, it's key to make sure that the fair amount of funding gets here. Right. And that's why it's important to participate. So if we get the accurate information, um, funding will be um, uh, accurate to the needs of the community. Right, so who, it helps with allocation of funds with various levels of government from federal to state to city. All and not that. only government use our data, but you can have school boards using our data. You may have planning commissions. Uh, for instance, if you are uh, writing a, a emergency evacuation plan, you may want to know how many people with disability have in certain areas within the Bronx, mm -hmm. families with children, elderly people living in households, so you can plan uh, your emergency evacuation plan. So it's right. in every level you can use this data. Cool. Uh, what, what is important about, the, about these surveys that the community should know about these activities? Um, First is don't be surprised if you get uh, contacted by the Census Bureau. It's not every 10 years. Mm -hmm. So you may be contacted by mail, mm -hmm. by phone, or a personal visit. It varies depending on the survey you were selected. Mm -hmm. It's important to know that your address was selected, not you as a person. And it's random selected. Okay. We have an um, address file and it's a system that um, random select these addresses. Uh, know that if a census person contacts you, um, well, the question is mailed to you, you have a chance to mail back. If mm -hmm. not, we'll give you a call and some surveys will call you, depending on how often it takes for that survey to happen. Mm -hmm. And if you have a person visiting your house, um, our uh, employees have a picture ID, a federal picture ID. They have to show to you the picture ID along with some materials about the purpose of their visit. Mm -hmm. And if you're not sure if that is a Census Bureau employee, if that's a legitimate survey, and this is really important, give us a call. And the number is 1800-991-2520. Give us a call. Ask the name of the person. Our, our employees have business cards. Keep a business card. Call our office and verify if that is a legitimate uh, visit. And if it is, um, participation is really important. So. Uh, just make sure you participate. Oh, that's very important for people to know that it's uh, your address was selected, not you as a person. Because I, I understand that some people might get a little jittery depending on their status, you know, their immigration status. If someone just shows up at their door, or what what kind of information they're giving away. On that note, what happens to their information once they give their to the census person? Every information collected by the Census Bureau is protected by law, mm -hmm. um, and. It's only used for statistical purposes. Okay. Um, we, um, our employees take oath for life to keep the information confidential. We cannot share with any agency or individual for 72 years. After wow. 72 years, the, the data is collected, then we can release some information for historical research, genealogy, and all that. But for 72 years, it's protected by federal law. And if um, the, uh, there's an unlawful disclosure of this information, mm -hmm. we are under a under penalty of $250,000 fine or five years in jail or both. Oh my. So none of us really want to play mess with that. I wouldn't want to no. mess with that either. No. That's a lot and, of money. <laughs> and not only that, this is such an important information and, and so crucial to have accurate information that making it confidential, it's 
is we know people participate. So it's important that we keep it confidential so people know it's safe to be part of it and we, in, we are going to be able to produce uh, vital statistics for the community. Uh, earlier you mentioned that the American Community Survey is one of the surveys conducted in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference between this kind of survey and the census itself? So with the census in 2010, every person, every house got a questionnaire. It was really short, simple questions, 10 questions. And the purpose was to count the population mm -hmm. and for reapportionment, redistricting. What we have with the American Community Survey, it's something that we actually have been done since the first census in, 19, in 1790. Um, we use the opportunity to collect, uh, aside from the basic demographics, some other information that's important for planning and mm -hmm. for understanding our community. It's just we use the decennial, um, since I think 1940, we had a long form add to it to add some extra information aside from the demographic. And when it came to 2005, and it's, it's such a fast change in our society nowadays that we need to collect the information more often every 10 years. So we got the long form that have been used since 1940. Mm -hmm. but Anyway, socioeconomic data collected since, since 1790 and turned into the American Community Survey. So that survey used to be the long form every 10 years. But if you're looking at, let's say, medium income from 2000 and you want to use in 2009, it kind of, it feels old. Right. And Inflation think it just, and everything. Yes, and yeah. how much a community has changed from 2000 to 2010. Mm -hmm. So you need that information up to date for right. planning. Then we started the American Community Survey, and it's a large sample. And uh, the interview is about a 30 minutes interview with every, uh, we include every person in the household. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's important to be accurate so we have a true picture of your community. Um, and the data from the American Community Survey is what you see being used to, to allocate about $400 billion in federal funding. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why uh, it's so important to be uh, accurate. Is it different from the census? Well, you just said that some of these surveys are you're randomly selected by your address, whereas the survey, like the census every 10 years is given to everyone in every address. Correct. Is the American Community Survey ra also randomly selected or is everyone going to get it? No, it's random selected. It's a survey, so we have a sample, mm -hmm. about 3.5 million households in the nation, so mm -hmm. it's a pretty large sample. Mm -hmm. But not everybody's going to get that. But since it's conducted every month of every year, mm -hmm. so there are chances we, that you end up in this sample. Okay. And the data is released every year. So, and the beauty of it is um, every year you can see how your community is changing or not changing. So if you uh, learn that you have this percent of population poverty uh, this year, you can look next year and see if that has changed. Right. And that's kind of important. It's, it's wonderful to see how, you, how your community has either grown or deteriorated and how you, how you can make changes, how the government can make changes, how, who you can go to to make changes to help yes. yourself. Yeah, government nowadays, any government, they're facing really tough decisions on how to provide funding and which programs and services they should invest or keep. So having the data will guide them towards making a better decision, a more informed decision. That's why it's, it's so important. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. We have to take a quick break, but first let's take a look at the premiere of an off-Broadway zombie musical like no other. Yes, Zombies! BronxNet correspondent Rina Valentin has more. We're here at the Peter J. Sharp Theater on 42nd Street for the opening of The Zombies, a musical, a journey that was created in the Bronx back in 2012. With two guitars and a keyboard in the Bronx, in the South Bronx, just sitting down trying to come with this kind of crazy stuff. It's been a, quite an adventure. Zone because people have been taking zombies very seriously, um, but we are not serious at all. We are camp fun, and zombies will come and sit in the audience with you and have a good time. I'm George the One Arm Zombie, so I, as the name suggests, only have one arm, so I'm dancing and doing everything with one arm. It's really hard. The zombies in the show are the opposite of the undead, essentially, because they're so uh, active and and lively with their movement. I wasn't sure what I would be doing with the zombies yet and then I met them and I realized that they were game for anything and I thought okay I'm gonna try to put every style of dance in the show that I can. What a wonderful day! Coming from the South Bronx where we took this project and wonderful wonderful actors, these young actors who are making, many of them are making their debut, they're, they're so excited, uh, obviously makes me excited. For chilling. The Zombies, a musical, captures the humor of the undead with vibrant singing and dancing, leaving the audience filled with life. I'm Rina Valentin, reporting for Bronx Snap.
Jimmy can't sing, and Tommy can't dance. So we're, we're gonna, gonna put some ants in their pants. Aww. Kids will spend 22 minutes watching us, the super duper party troopers, sing about ants in their pants. Isn't that funny? Ants in their pants, they got ants in their pants. They got ants in their pants. Brushing for two minutes now can save your child from severe tooth pain later. Two minutes, twice a day. They have the time. A single ember from a wildfire can travel over a mile. That ember can ignite and destroy your home or community. You can't control where that ember will land. Only what happens before it does. Visit fireadapted.org to learn how you can help protect your community from wildfires. Know what? What? Since I got adopted, I've learned a lot about these humans. Uh, I know. I mean, check out these two. It's Flirt City over here. Yeah, I noticed that. It looks like my human is definitely into your human. Oh, look! I think she's getting his number. Nice. Your human's got some sweet moves. Takes after his dog. <laughs> oh, look, they're doing that thing where they put their arms around each other. She kicked up a leg. It's like in the movies. That's awesome. Looks like we're going to be hanging out a little bit more. Welcome back to Open as we continue our discussion with Alexandra Barker, Data Dissemination Specialist and Media Relations from the U.S. Census Bureau. Welcome back. Thank so we, we were just talking about the census and the surveys that you're doing in between the various census every 10 years. So what can you share with us about the findings from the Bronx? Okay, so I did bring some uh, nice information about the Bronx about, from our uh, programs, Fantastic. especially from the American Mint Surveys. So mm -hmm. just about population. Um, in the Bronx, our last estimated population was about 1.4 million, and this is as of July 1st, 13. So there was an increase in 2.4% in population since the 2010 census. Wow. And we also have um, females. We have more females in the Bronx than males, about 53% of your population. Yes, go ladies. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, that's interesting that the, you said was 2.4% increase, increase in population from 2010, and it's only been four years. And that's 13 estimates. So it's actually, you're looking at three years because the estimates for 2010 is April 1st, and then you have these estimates for July 1st, 13. So it's like three years, 2.4 increase. That's but, a big yeah. jump. Yes. What you were talking about, like that's why we need to keep these accurate records with surveys every year, every month, instead of every 10 years. Yeah, so you know how it's changing, how quickly it's changing. Right, wow. Yes. Uh, we also have some information about race and ethnicity. I think that's always important to know mm -hmm. how diverse the population is. Um, so for the Bronx, I think that problem is not a surprise <laughs> to all of you. We have uh, the population, 54% um, of people in the Bronx are of Hispanic ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Just keep in mind that Hispanics can be of any race. Right. Um, but as, uh, talking about race, we have three major groups here too. We have whites um, alone, not Hispanic, about 22% of your population. Mm -hmm. We have uh, black populations, about 34% of uh, the Bronx uh, population. And, and then that's we black, non-Hispanic. It's black, non-Hispanic, that's right. And then we have some other race, about 40%, which could be Hispanic or any person identify as some other race. <laughs> right. Um, and one thing I also find interesting about the Bronx is the large foreign-born population. It's about 35% of the people living in the Bronx. They are, are foreign-born. Foreign they are foreign-born, yeah. And you have about 45% um, they, they were uh, naturalized U.S. citizens of the foreign-born population. Okay, so that's not too bad. And yeah. people working toward getting their green card or citizenship. That's fantastic. So then I guess it wouldn't be a surprise to anybody being that the Hispanic population is the largest that... There, therefore, Spanish is the language that's spoken most often in the Bronx, but do we have other language diversity here? Um, sir, you may. I did bring that specifically on the language. We do have actually a graph that will bring groups like the Indo-European languages. They have 9.7% speaking Indo-European languages here. Asian languages about 2.3%. Mm -hmm. Other languages about 74 But clearly with a population um, is who we speak other language at home, other than English, mm -hmm. uh, you have about 80% speaking in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And within this, this population of Spanish speakers, about 45% uh, answer that they do not speak English very well. So there you have a group that will need assistance with translation and a variety of services and language services. So that can inform decisions and whether to use um, and that's important language again, um, services. As, yes. as we were talking about, they, there are populations that maybe just do not know because they can't, they don't speak the language or they can't read. And there are opportunities open to them, and the Census Bureau can help us 
or help them also find ways to improve their situation through this kind of information. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about education. Yes. Within our population, uh, what's it like to be educated in the, in the Bronx? Well, um, when you talk about school dropouts, you have a rate of about 30% of uh, drop, school dropouts, which means you, you didn't complete high school, um, so you don't have a high school diploma. Um, you left school before that. And in, when it comes to uh, higher education, like a bachelor's degree, about 12.3% of the population of Bronx have a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. um, we do have data on school enrollment, too. I didn't bring it today. Um, knowing who are in school right now, it's also important, knowing how many kids are enrolled in different grades. But when it comes to at least measuring the population that are 25 years and over, that have had a chance to graduate from college, let's put it that way, right. you have a 30% um, school dropout rate and you have bachelor's degree 12.3%. Um, we didn't really speak about this particularly, but I do have a question that, um, about commutes to work. Can you tell us a little bit about Commuting job? to work? Yeah. Yeah, we do collect data on... Uh, people, uh, workers, and how they uh, commute to work, if they drive, they use public transportation. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the Bronx, it, it may not be a surprise that you know your community really well. Mm -hmm. That is basically just going to uh, provide evidence, mm -hmm. number of evidence about what you know about your community. But in the Bronx, from all the workers, 16 years and over, mm -hmm. uh, about 60% use public transportation to go to work. And uh, we ha it takes about, for those who drive, which is, let me just refer here, um, it's about 23% uh, drive to work from here. Mm -hmm. It takes them an average of 43 minutes to get to work. Right. And this information, it's key for planners when they're looking where they're gonna open maybe the next train station or even with stoplights that people are driving, how long it takes them to mm -hmm. improve transportation in this area, more buses, more trains. Uh, the data can be very rich. So if you look into detail, you'll be able to see how many people bike to work, how many work at home and see how this is changing over time, which is the beauty of this survey, is and, looking at trends. And that comes from the American Community Survey that That's you spoke correct. of. Yeah, and then you can see the trends, how it's changing. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, what else can we learn about like the socioeconomic situation from this American Community Survey? Yeah, which is a big piece of information, especially when you went through economic crisis, learning mm -hmm. about jobs and income and poverty, it's, it's really crucial for any community. Well, with employment, I can tell you that about 50% of the population, 16 and over, in the labor force are employed in the Bronx. That's all we have for employment. 16%? Wow. Uh, 50%. Oh, 15. Okay. Yeah, the population 16 and Ooh. over, which is considered <laughs> in the labor force, mm -hmm. 50% employed. Um, and we also have um, a l some information on what um, industries they work. So we have 31.5% of your workers working on the educational services, healthcare, and social assistance industry. So that's the primary industry of work okay. within the Bronx population. When it comes to income, which is also another important uh, measure, uh, the medium household income in the Bronx um, was 32, about $32,000 a year. Okay. And 27% of the households had income below $15,000 a year. Wow. And 4% had income over one hundred and fifty. dollars thousand a year. Four percent, so we're not particularly rich people here in the Bronx. <laughs> well, the data yeah. can show you what th this uh, sometimes right. of disparities. Mm -hmm. um, and 24 percent of the households receive Social Security, so we also collect information on benefits. Okay. Um, so you have a, a, a population receiving Social Security income right now. When it comes to poverty, which is another uh, important uh, statistics, uh, we have 31 percent of people in the Bronx uh, in 2012 were in poverty. And 44 percent of related children under 18 below the poverty level as well. Wow. And when you talk about the elderly community, you have 25% of the population, 65 and over, under poverty. So you do have 44% um, um, uh, of children mm -hmm. in poverty and 25% um, of the elderly in poverty. Wow, that's, yeah. that's a pretty big uh, percentage. Yeah. And, and I mean, I'm okay. sorry, it's, it's actually really important because uh, we just recently, the, the Bronx Borough President has been talking about uh, making a living wage here for people in the Bronx um, with new malls that are being built and things like that. And this is a perfect example of why we need that, of children and elderly, I mean, being below the poverty level. It's incredible. We need to have something in place that lets people take care of themselves and get them out of that poverty. Yeah, and I was, um, as I read about the Bronx uh, and about the data, I see they have a, a large female population, some of them head of households that actually, uh, some data here showing, I believe I brought in a graph that shows that you have a large number of families with female householders. It's the poverty chart. Mm -hmm. um, 
when you see that uh, most of uh, the single moms, 40% of single moms are below poverty level too, um, it's, it's an important piece of information. So you have like one single mom and children, 43% of population, that situation, poverty, that's another important piece of statistics for planning. That's, that is very And for important. services, yeah. So um, is there any other interesting aspects about the community you'd like to share? Um, I also brought some information about health insurance and about um, tenure, whether you own or rent your home. Uh, in regards to health insurance, 85% um, of the population of the Bronx have health insurance. Good. 51% <laughs> of those use public insurance. And when it comes to children, about 4% of the children in the Bronx were uninsured in 2012. Okay. And aside from health insurance information, we also have some housing information. And um, you have a large population living, um, um, uh, paying rent. So 81% of your population are renters. Mm -hmm. Only 19% own their home. homeowners. Yes. Gotcha. And of those who rent, 62% spend more, 30% uh, or more of the income in housing, in renting only, which mm -hmm. is a big chunk of income used in housing. So this is some of the information I brought. There's a lot more than that. The debt is very rich. And for any organization, our debt is free. It's, uh, it's public information. It's our website, the mm -hmm. statistics. For any organization looking into accessing our data for their grant application, for planning, Please reach out to us in our office. We'll be glad to assist you with data increase, teach you how to access our data. It's a free service of the Census Bureau. All you have to do is call us. Can I give the number? Yes, of absolutely. Our give the number. Sure. Our department, it's 212-584-3440. Uh, mm -hmm. You'll get to our department, the Data Simulation Department, and we can help you with any data you need. Great. Thank you so much. I was just about to ask you that. <laughs> um, if your address was selected for a Census Bureau survey, please participate. More than $400 million in federal funds are distributed every year to states and communities based on data generated from the Census Bureau. We have to take a quick break, but first, let's take a look at how the third annual Dominican Film Festival promotes the new generation of Dominican filmmakers, as well as the established ones, and introduce them to the American audiences. BronxNet correspondent Yela Juberes has more. <laughs> Bueno, mira, eh, yo me siento extremadamente contento de haber fundado el Festival de Cine. Es una labor titánica y ver el resultado de que la gente quiere apoyar el cine dominicano me da más energía para seguir adelante. I'm so proud and I'm just so glad I'm part of this. I, I think we need more of these types of fest film festivals for our culture and I'm just glad I'm part of this. Tanto orgullo. I mean, this is my first time here coming and uh, it's amazing to see so many Dominican artists here. It's bringing together the artists who live in Santo Domingo and us here in New York who still come from our Dominican background and, and getting the community together and bringing good, the good work from our people. La juventud está muy entusiasmada con todo el movimiento cinematográfico que hay allá. O sea, esta es una cosa maravillosa. It's the third annual and we have a packed house, two floors, filled up auditorium right in Washington Heights. So it's quite... Uh, Really, it's pretty cool. When there's a Dominican event, I'm there because I believe that we have to support each other. Um, and I'm just super excited to see what we're going to see tonight. I'm very proud being a Dominican that the Dominican Film Association is here in the United States, breaking boundaries and getting the art known. NFC, AFC, offensive linemen, defensive tackles, quarterbacks, and cornerbacks are all working with United Way for a million little reasons, the kids of our communities, to ensure their academic success all the way to graduation day. You see, it takes about 12 years to create a graduate, but it takes the same time to create a dropout. And the difference between a kid becoming one or the other could be a professional athlete or it could be you. Studies showed the earlier we get to kids, the better their chances. So become a United Way volunteer reader, tutor, or mentor, and make a difference in the life of a child, for the life of that child. Give. Advocate. Volunteer. Live United. Join your favorite NFL players. Take the pledge. Go to unitedway.org. Adopting a new pet is a rewarding experience. And shelter pets make super pets. Your new best friend will steal your heart, bring you happiness, and enrich your life for years to come. You can make a difference in the life of an animal. 
Adopt and bring home a shelter pet today. <laughs> to find out more, visit the shelterpetproject.org. Long before I was in Hollywood, I had a grandmother by the name of Estelle Marie Tanner, positive role model to make sure that I was on a straight path. Big Brothers Big Sisters carefully screens volunteers and places them in long-term mentoring matches with kids who face adversity. With more volunteers, especially men, and more donations, every little who needs a big can have it. Start something. If it's been a while since you've been involved, start something again. Learn more at BigBrothersBigSisters.org. Welcome back to Open. I'm your host, Cristina Pagan. Yesterday, the South Bronx Company Scenic launched the biggest interweb mall on the superhighway, NYCNAK.com. The official opening of, how do you say that? Knickknack. Knickknack was commemorated with an event at Scenic's offices and studios in Mott Haven. Here to tell us more about the interweb mall is Sputnik, oh, good grief. Uh, director Shinez Bali and Scenic Director Philip Schreer. I should have asked you guys how to say that beforehand, but anyway, welcome. So, um, Thank you. tell us a little bit about Cynic and how these new websites are going to help with media and the Bronx. Oh, well, thank you so much for having us on the show, no Christina. Um, well, Cynic is the digital workflow company, mm -hmm. and uh, it's originally uh, specialized in both media and technology. Started in 2000, we moved to the South Bronx, Mott Haven, uh, in 2005. So we've been there nine years. Mm -hmm. um, at first, it was mostly about uh, affordable commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we fell in love with the borough. So I eventually moved myself uh, to, to the Bronx from Manhattan as well. Mm -hmm. So now I live in, in Mott Haven uh, uh, as well. Yeah. Uh, and as far as, uh, well, Sputnik is one of our brands. I'll let Chinez talk about that. And knickknack.com is uh, our own digital distribution e-commerce sites. Uh, so we're going to be selling uh, digital products, mm -hmm. uh, music and art to begin with. Okay. So t tell us a little bit about Sputnik then. So Sputnik is the marketing, promotion and advertising division of Scenic, mm -hmm. which is the, the umbrella company, if you will. Uh-oh, umbrella company that brings zombies we were just talking about. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yes, yeah, so we, we produce events. So we've thrown over 50 events in the South Bronx. Oh. At Bruckner Barn Grill, mainly a strategic partner, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good food, um, and uh, and one of the the milestone, I guess, events that we produced last or two years ago was the Art Design Music Show, mm -hmm. basically aimed to showcase South Bronx talent, a community fun-filled, you know, family-friendly uh, day, awesome. and that's the type of event that we're, I guess, starting to become more interested in, in producing. That sounds great. Um, off camera, you were talking about a media bias and a technology bias. Can you explain a little bit what that means and how this new interweb mall counteracts all of that? Uh, great question. <laughs> um, well, you know, when it comes to, to, to the web, making websites, uh, designing web software, and, and digital marketing in general, mm -hmm. uh, the way that, that the business has evolved uh, is on one side you have advertising agencies that traditionally have clients uh, who trust them on creative direction and design. Uh, so advertising agencies have been getting into the technology business of course, uh, but they still retain a sort of media bias to everything that they do. So the creative, the design ends up, and the media buying ends up being the important part of the equation and you know technology is just kind of tacked on. Uh, and then conversely, uh, in the software world, uh, we're specialists in web software, so you know, through your browser, web apps. Uh, in, the, in the software world, um, well, a lot of the time, uh, engineers uh, are not necessarily uh, oriented towards communication. <laughs> you know, they, they tend stay in their to own box in their world. What you're trying to say, the cubicle. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's part of uh, part of the profession. And the culture, yeah, it's and the culture, the culture, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so, so the, the 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 media component is is kind of lacking for a lot of, of software companies. Mm -hmm. So when we started the company, our, our our goal was was to do both without a bias. Uh, you know, the media and technology on an equal plane, and that's what the web is. It's it's both uh, a way to communicate uh, and and a way to to uh, further technological development. And what, what is 
then the this interweb that you launched yesterday, Nick Knack, right? That was yeah, Nick Knack. Um, well, we've been building e-commerce sites for clients for about uh, eight years now, mm -hmm. uh, and we've also been producing our own our own content, our own uh, digital content. So actually, Shanez and I are both in a band. Uh, she's a singer, I'm a drummer. Uh -oh. um, we have a recording studio at our place of business, uh, and so we produce our, our own music. And then there are a number of about, about 15 visual artists who we work with on a regular basis, uh, whether on client work or, or just on art and design in general. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to be distributing uh, digital versions of, of that content. Uh, we figured it was time to uh, build our own e-commerce site uh, in part because we always try to convince our clients to do things a certain way and we never <laughs> were <are> successful <laughs> right <laughs> so you know at least you have this site uh, that you know, we have this site that we can show now and say you know this is kind of how we see selling products online this this is this is how we see it that's, um, that's pretty interesting I mean uh, I know I know people say often that when you you're working in an in a industry you work for someone for a certain amount of time and then you feel like you have to grow and that sounds like what your company has done you were working for other people and now it's time to do your own thing and show them that your way may be better and prove yourself right how did you guys come together then um sputnik and scenic were you working at, in scenic before sputnik came about and, or did you say listen this is something that i have that i want to contribute I guess I started with Scenic initially and eventually got into the events planning, producing, behind the scene kind of stuff. So <laughs> eventually, I is it something, it something you enjoy doing? I really do, actually. Yeah. What 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 about it particularly appeals to you? The planning, I guess. The planning. Like, well, seeing everything come together, trying to figure out the ways, you know, to orchestrate an event. It's it's a lot of thought goes into it, and we were perfectionists for sure <laughs> so it's it's an interesting experience every time you guys said you, he said you're in a band and you're the singer yes uh, is that band related to the company or is it just you guys are doing that outside of it is related to the company did it come like did did scenic start and they say hey you do this and you do that let's make form a band or were you in the band first and then well, I'll let you explain that because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I find that's, in, that's intriguing to me like, how does that work? yeah the soul of the company is really music mm-hmm uh, everything started around music. Uh, Does my, everything? In my parents' basement, um, <laughs> pretty precise, in Manhattan. Uh, we were in a band, and you know, being in a band, you have to design flyers, you have to take photography of the band, you have to plan events, you know, promote yourself, right. uh, you know, play and out. Uh, everything know. that goes into what your company is about, right? Exactly. Yeah, and then eventually, you know, you had mailing lists, email lists. So that's really got what got us into into software, mm -hmm. strangely enough. And then it <clears throat> just expanded from there. You know, a group of people coming together around music who had different specialties and interests, and it just uh, blossomed. How can people access uh, Nick Knack, and what should they expect to find? <laughs> well, right now uh, the site is not yet live. Okay. Uh, that's that's so we have a, a landing page at nicknack.com. Mm -hmm. uh, we're planning on on. on making it live over the weekend Great. so um yeah that's that's kind of what happens in <laughs> the software world a lot of the time so there you go nicknack.com nyc nak um, but uh, certainly encourage people to check out uh, sputnik as well as, as scenic and, and all the the attached uh, brands there's an nyc thing going on with all the names so. i see that <laughs> you have a running theme going on whether it's at the front or the back um so what can people expect to see once Nick Knack is actually up and running? Um, a very simple interface mm -hmm. that is really focused on, on the content, so the, the art itself. Mm -hmm. um, Are you promoting anyone else other than your band on that? or? Uh, originally, uh, we're pretty focused uh, on ourselves. We just want to see how it's going to work out. Mm -hmm. uh, the pricing models are pretty complicated when it comes to <laughs> yeah content on the web. Right. Um, I mean, part of the reason we started is also because we distribute through iTunes, okay. and and iTunes is, is kind of difficult to deal with. You just feel like you're in this sea of stuff, and that you don't really really matter. It's sort of impersonal. Gotcha. So, um, so something that's pretty personal. We hope is representative of the of the Bronx uh, in some measure. You know, uh, what kind I of, uh, I'm sorry. What kind of music do you play? 
Uh, well, it's a mix of uh, jazz, blues, uh, rock, pop, and, and, and house music. A little bit of everything? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> For everyone, exactly. basically. Yeah. <laughs> do, do you ever, like, when you guys are jamming and putting something together, just, well, I think we should add elements of this and then that, and then it becomes a mishmash, and then you pull it back and say, oh, my God, this is amazing. Like, mm, do you do that? <laughs> oh, I hope it is amazing. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's a very international group, okay. scenic in general. Is it from every, everyone's in the Bronx, or are you from all over the place? Uh, pretty much all over oh, the really place. Yeah. yeah. Um, there are multiple bands too. We have a small record company that's it's and a record to company CM. too. Wow, you guys yeah, are very records. impressive. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you don't put out any more records though, right? No vinyl, no CDs, just all digital, yeah. Hmm. Well, yeah. hopefully you get to put out vinyl. A vinyl? I think yeah, I hear it's coming back. I was watching a report that vinyl is making a comeback for some reason. Yeah, the sound quality. The sound quality. Mm -hmm. I, I remember playing uh, records when I was a kid. They get scratched very easily, especially if you listen to them a lot, jumping around. And I imagine if you guys are playing house, people will jump around and scratch up the vinyl, <laughs> and then they'll have to buy another one, so it'll be great. <laughs> That sounds like a good marketing strategy right there. <laughs> right. Well, good luck to you guys. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. We have to take a quick break, but first, let's take a look as we remember and pay tribute to one of our very own. Bronx Knit correspondent Ma Veronica Giddy has more. On the weekend of Father's Day, folks gathered to remember the beloved husband, father, grandfather, and friend. Ibrahim Gonzalez passed away last year on June 4th, and a year later, family and friends paid tribute to a man never to be forgotten. He was a person that had the special gift, like my grandmother, to make you feel like you were his favorite person. Such a, an important person in this community and someone who gave to so many should never be forgotten. One of the most touching tributes was from Ibrahim's wife, who played a rendition of From a Distance. And then that song that I played, I played for him because it has spaces in it where you stop and you just think about loving somebody. The talented musician's spirit filled the church as the choir rendered a selection of his arrangement to Amazing Grace. Pastor McFarlane of Epiphany Lutheran Church talks of Ibrahim's influence in the church and in the community. Ibrahim himself had been involved with the church over many years, so there's a history with the congregation. Ibrahim also let his voice be heard for 23 years as a popular radio show personality on WBAI and as an access producer with Bronson and Community Television. His longtime run-in radio show, In the Moment, featured jazz artists, interviews, and stories of his childhood. A lover of jazz, the tribute ended with a Latin jazz concert by a few family and friends. His brother plays the congas, the instrument Ibrahim was known for playing so well. Ibrahim showed me how to play congas. I'm a 10-year-old playing with all these 18-year-olds on congas, you know, so he, he always used to involve his family. He played everywhere and the music was accepted and loved and that's what music does and he knew that, that, that special language. He's still here, he's still with us, he's a part of us. and. Uh, maybe physically he's not here, but I still feel the spirit whenever we play. A colorful personality, a bright light to family and friends. Ibrahim is truly missed, but stays close to the hearts of those he loved and loved him back. For BronzeNet, I'm Veronica Guiti. So you, you heard of the Chewbacca fish? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Chewbacca who? Well, yeah. You heard of the Chewbacca fish, haven't you? I, uh, yes, I did. Okay. And could, just so the people at home know, describe it real quick for us. Uh, describe what? It's a fish that flies out of the water, like almost like a rocket. It goes like 12 feet in the air. And then what happens is it comes back down before it hits the water. It like flies into people's neck and like starts biting you in the neck and in the face. Well, I'll tell you one thing. If it's out there, I'm going to catch it on camera because I've been out here with, with, my, with my camera for years. You know how the Chewbacca fish works? What happens is it, it shoots it like rockets out of the water, like five feet in the air, and then as it's come, it jumps, exactly, it jumps, and, and then what happens, like five feet in the air, comes down, like, you know, right before it hits the water, like it like does a psych, and, you know, one of these moves and flies into your neck and starts like biting you and stuff. Nah. They, don't, they don't have the fish like that out here, do they? Yeah, it's the, the Chewbacca fish. That's yeah, what they, they have it out here in the Bronx? 
dead. Yeah. Oh my God. And then what happens is right before it comes and hits the water. Yeah, he died to hit somebody. Exactly. Welcome back. Let's take a look as cultural ambassador Baron Ambrosia explores the work of a prominent DJ. It's really interesting when I think about DJ Jazzy J, and I know a lot of people in New York know about him, but don't realize that he's part of the Bias family, and we still have the biases on St. Helena Island, just a couple miles away from here, down Seaside Road, as well as those that are on Ladies Island, where Jazzy grew up. And so I know back in the day, as folks would say, when he was growing up, there was a lot of differences than what you see today. First of all, I was born and raised down there, and, um, for me, it was like, uh, you know, being a country boy that I am, you know, you can take the boy out of the country, but you ain't gonna never take the country out of him, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I, I always had my, my, my upbringing, like, you know, for my, uh, my grandmother, who uh, actually raised me. And of course, I was born in an environment where, you know, we had much family in South Carolina, and everybody treated everybody with utmost respect, you know, whether they didn't have any money or nothing like that, everybody was still happy in their existence, you know what I'm saying? We lived in little shacks and little, you know, houses that, you know, would probably be would be deemed subpar at this time. But back then, we was happy with what we had, you know what I'm saying? We lived off the land, you know what I'm saying? I remember my earliest years, you know, just like running around in the fields, you know, barefoot, chasing after chickens, uh, 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 going in the fields, pulling a watermelon out the ground and just kind of like hitting it on the ground till it opens up and then you just dig in and eat what you want and rest, put it right back down to the earth, you know? And, uh, you know, those are like the best, the best memories I can, you know, just remember besides just, just growing up in an environment where, you know, I had so many elders we had a certain pride about us, you know, we was proud of what we, where we came from and, 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 and the roots, you know, even though we didn't speak that, that the Queen's English as they so speak, you know what I'm saying, our English was always broken down and I, I didn't understand this until when I moved to New York and then everybody was like looking at me like, what he say? And I thought I was just speaking English and then, you know, didn't know it was a dialect that was like uh, not really followed by a lot of people outside of Frogmore, Tom Fripp, or, you know, the Gullah Islands over there where I was from, you know, you leave out of there, you go you go a little bit up north a little bit, you know, a, a little piece up the road, a little more, a little more, whatever, or down yonder, you go down yonder a piece and they wouldn't know what the hell you was talking about. I could be, you know, I could be three or four years old, wander down the field and end up in somebody else's backyard and they, oh, that's Miss Eula's grandson. You know, I end up in Miss Mary's yard or uh, 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 down Kusaw Road. And they're like, oh, ain't that so and so so? And they'll grab me up and deliver me back to my grandmother, whatever the deal is. But it was a whole neighborhood, uh, not even a neighborhood, it was a whole tribe. 
And then that was the ideology, you know, from our original ideology, it takes a whole tribe to raise a child. Granny was like more or less, you know, the local witch doctor, you know, and she wasn't, she wasn't, you know, by herself. These were remedies that were passed down, you know, through the times because, you know, you, you didn't go to the store and get no bare aspirins or some anisins or some Tylenol. When you got sick, you know what I'm saying, they had the old world remedies, you know what I'm saying, they'd go out in the fields and grab some leaves from this tree and, you know, they knew exactly what to grab, what to mix it with, and they'd mix up a batch of some nasty tasting whatever it was, but you know what, after you took that and, and you did your thing, you felt a lot better. You know what I'm saying? People lived down there to be, you know, 80 and 90 years in a, in a time, 90 years old in a time when people were dying at the age of 50s and 60s and all of that, you know what I'm saying? And in the general, like people down there, because we lived off of the land and a lot of the stuff wasn't filled with a lot of, you know, a lot of chemicals and steroids or whatever the deal was, you know what I'm saying? People ate a lot better because of the fact that you raised and you, and you ate from the land. That's where a lot of people migrated from the south, they always ended up in Harlem first. So that's where we ended up. We ended up in Harlem. That was, you know, my introduction to the city life and at a young age. But then I found out when I got to New York, I had a whole host of cousins and, you know, they were all my age and we kind of all grew up together like a little mob. You know what I'm saying? It was just a, a mob of back in those days. You know, black folks was making a lot of babies back in the 60s, so it wasn't until like some years later that, that you know, we would have to leave Harlem because we were, they had a devastating fire in the building. We got relocated to uh, some sort of like little shelter situation at that time. There for a while, then that's when we got relocated to the place that would uh, kind of set the tone for the person named Jazzy J. And I moved from uh, there, we moved to 174th Street and Harrod Avenue, Bronx River Projects. When I was in Harlem, I knew about the Black Spades because, you know, the gangs was, they were there. But it wasn't as evident to me because of the fact that, you know, the gangs were, you know, these were, we lived in tenement buildings. And, you know, the gangs were scattered, like some people lived on some block, blah, blah, blah. They would all get together and, you know, maybe in the park, Riverside Park or whatever the deal is. And then, you know, do they blah, 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 their business. And, you know, you see them with the colors, but they wouldn't gather. Now, when you go to Bronx River, the gangs were all right there in the product. So you couldn't help but to see all of that. And now I'm going to the Bronx with my South Carolina demeanor, which is like, you know, we don't take no sh from nobody. We from the country and we will, we will whip your tail. All right. Then I got my Harlem demeanor. Man, I'll kick yo from Harlem, USA, baby. You know, Harlem, we don't play. This is Harlem, USA. You know what I'm saying? I get to the Bronx and I start talking to this, uh, this right away. I'm Harlem signifying. Yeah, you know, yeah. Harlem born, baby. You know, Harlem, USA. You know what I'm saying? That's Timothy Cooper, Haldorf, and yam me right in the face. Boom! I'm like, wow. Didn't see that one coming. Yo, you in the Bronx now. I was like, okay, maybe I should just tune this Harlem thing down a little bit. At least, at least stop down in the Bronx and start getting with the program since I do live here now. Live with a human for a while and you get to know a few things. Like, I know she does strange tricks for no treats. But the one thing I will never for the life of me know is how she gets so tiny and inside that box. Natalie, how do you get so tiny? The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. All right, give me a spot. You know my motto, safety first. They could be dangerous. I think we should call animal control. Animal control? To be safe. Don't worry. Just... I got this. It's a new motto.
You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. Welcome back to Open. Uh, today marks the fifth anniversary of the death of Michael Jackson, a prolific entertainer in, our, in this generation, known as the King of Pop. Um, he was very influential to me as a child. He's one of the reasons I got into dance. I had the only crush on Michael Jackson when I was a kid. In fact, my, uh, my first pet, a turtle, was named Michael Jackson. And boy, was he fast. Um, in commemoration of the fifth anniversary of the death of Michael Jackson, I would love to read one of his poems to you. It's called Magical Child. Once there was a child, and he was free. Deep inside, he felt the laughter, the mirth, and play of nature's glee. Beauty, love, was all he'd see. He knew his power was the power of God. He was so sure, they considered him odd. This power of innocence, of compassion, of light threatened the priests and created a fight. In endless ways they sought to dismantle this mysterious force which they could not handle. In endless ways they tried to destroy his simple trust, his boundless joy. His invincible armor was a shield of bliss. Nothing could touch it, no venom, no hiss. The child remained in a state of grace. He wasn't confined in time or place. In technicolor dreams he frolicked and played while acting his part. In eternity he stayed. Soothsayers came and fortunes were told. Some were vehement, others were bold. In denouncing this child, this perplexing creature with the rest of the world, he shared no feature. Is he real? He is so strange. His unpredictable nature knows no range. He puzzles us so. Is he straight? What's his destiny? What's his fate? And while they whispered and conspired through endless rumors to get him tired, to kill his wonder, trample him near, burn his courage, fuel his fear, the child remained just simple, sincere. All he wanted was the mountain high, color the clouds, paint the sky beyond these boundaries he wanted to fly. In nature's scheme, never to die. Don't stop this child. He's the father of man. Don't cross his way. He's part of the plan. I am that child, but so are you. We've just forgotten, just lost the clue. Inside your heart sits a seer. Between his thoughts, he can hear. A simple melody, but wondrously clear. The music of life, so precious, so dear. If you could for one moment know this spark of creation, this exquisite glow, you would come and dance with me. Kindle this fire so we could see all the children of the earth wave their magic and give new birth to a world of freedom with no pain, a world of joy, much more sane. Deep inside you, you know it's true. Just find that child. It's hiding in you. Love you, Michael. Well, before we go, No Longer Empty invites you to the opening of If You Build It in the new Broadway housing community Sugar Hill Building, designed by architect David Ajay. And the opening reception will be held today, June 25th, from 7 to 9 p.m. on 155th Street at St. Nicholas Avenue. The exhibit will run from June 26th to August 10th. For more info, please visit nolongerempty.org. In this very somber day, um, I'd also it's regretfully report to you that character actor Eli Wallach has passed away at 98. Um, he's... You could see him in several films. Uh, he was, had a prolific uh, career as well. He's a very memorable face. <laughs> so rest in peace to him and our condolences to his family. Well, it's been a pleasure coming into your homes. I'd like to thank our guests for joining us and you, the viewers, for tuning in. If you missed any part of today's show, you can catch the re-cable cast at 10 p.m. on Cablevision Channel 67, Fios 33, or watch anytime on the web at bronxnet.org.